in this new series, this year, 2014, we're calling it Shine, and it's all for the purpose of you being light bearers for Jesus. And, uh, and, and, it's, and, and it has a secondary effect, and that is that you grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are going from one element of um, spirituality to another one. And it's like climbing a ladder and growing to be more and more like Jesus. So we're asking you in this series to reevaluate your life in Christ. Walking with Jesus impacts your life. The way you think, speak, act, behave, react, and respond. And Jesus' life impact is His growing investment on you. And every year is a life change year. Or it should be. And uh, we have an opportunity, a grand opportunity, here uh, this year to, to see that. So we're asking for a re-evaluation call in 2014, to go beyond 2013 and to leave that behind and ask, is my life bearing the light of Jesus for all to see? And whenever you reevaluate your spiritual growth pattern, there are questions to ask. So we um, have have done that. Now I, I want you to, uh, to to know before we get going. And, and everyone see the dipper here? Yes. Like the stars, huh? So I'm, I'm thinking that it's little specks of, because we had one speck and Wayne went up there and did his magic, so we have to get one of those feather things to kind of clean that up. But um, anyhow, we're going to uh, we're, we're going to talk from Matt, Micah six eight. We have given you a series of verses from both the Old Testament and the New Testament that point to this reevaluation, resolving in 2014, to be a light for Christ, to shine for Him. But our pivotal verse is this one here. And it says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. And so uh, we want to kind of begin to uh, go through this verse and and look exactly um, what is God trying to say to us. Now, as always, we've given you an opportunity on the back of your worship folder, as the, the, the new revised standard worship folder, um, for you to, uh, to follow along on the things that we're talking about. We've given you just a bit of a background, too, of, of what we talked about. But um, it, it's, it's always fun to, to reach out and to, uh, and to hear some other perspectives so this, this isn't so much a perspective on a um, on another verse, but it's uh, it's something that helps us. So um, watch Tony Evans as he speaks here. To be a disciple means more than you have devotions and that you are part of a small group and that you attend church regularly. As important as that is, it means you are crafting and carrying a worldview into the world in which you live. So that that world gets to see your worldview. That world gets to see the kingdom up there on the field down here. That, um, until, until this world sees that world operating in your world, you are not a follower of Jesus Christ publicly. How can we have all these churches on all these corners with all these members and all these Christians and all these leaders and, and all these programs and all these facilities and all these resources and still have all this mess? There's a dead monkey on the line somewhere. And that is the absence of disciples. Through our national ministry, the Urban Alternative, we send out CDs and DVDs across the country of people who want the sermons every week. So what I do is I stand up on Sunday morning at our church locally and I preach a message. That message is recorded on a master CD recorder. Then it is taken from the master CD recorder into a duplicating room. 
The master CD is placed on the master duplicator, plugged into the master duplicator are slave units. These slave units run off 16 copies at a time, depending on how many units are plugged into the master unit. 16 copies are run off very quickly, and then they are sent all across the country of people who have ordered the CDs. When a person gets the CD, they get a copy of what I have preached locally from where I was situated in our local congregation on Sunday. What they get where they are is a copy of what I produce where I am. I'm not where they are, but they get what I produce. And when they get what I produce, it's precisely what I gave because what they get is a copy of the master. They get a copy that is a replica of what was produced produced on the master. Jesus Christ is up there. You are his CDs down here. Your job and my job is to be a replication down here as a copy of what he is up there and that is discipleship. That's what we call shine. Yeah, right? That's what we're talking about. There isn't going to be a test on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's kind of it's kind of fun, don't you think, to hear a little different perspective from somebody else. And uh, Tony Evans can really say it, can he? So we appreciate him, and uh, and for him reminding us that Jesus is a master, and we and we are the replication of him. And so um, so we're we're doing this reevaluation. We're asking, where am I? with God is what we began with and with others and where am I going as light bearers and last week we finished up by asking what do I need a God search and a God scan and and now we're coming to the very next question and that is what do I do what do I do and this is why Micah 6 8 is so vital and so important. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. So he's telling you. He's telling you. Some of your versions say he has showed you what God requires. What is good? And so here's, here's what we need to do. We need to know God. Know God. And we may know Him in a surface way, but spiritual growth <coughs> is getting to know Him in a deeper way. And that's what we want to do. And that's what this verse actually is saying. He's told you, oh man. Because you know, God knows you. He knows your ways. He knows your works. He knows your inward will. And despite all that, He still loves you. And He loves you enough to show you and to tell you what pleases Him. He tells you what to do to meet Him. To be with Him. And even to enjoy Him. So let's ask. What does God tell you? What does God tell you? Well what I want you to know is that God speaks to you through His Word. He speaks to you through His Word. A God encountered life impact is God speaking to you through the scriptures which become a growth investment? God speaks to you through his word. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, a very, very familiar passage and one that I'm going to quote from a newer version, the, the uh, contemporary English version, says this, Everything in the scriptures is God's word. It is useful for teaching and helping people and for correcting them, showing them, what? <laughs> showing them how to live. 
The scriptures train God's servants to do all kind of good deeds. Now some of the words that you heard there in that verse coincides with our key verse, Micah 6, 8, right? He has showed us how to live and how to do good deeds. So let me say this. God's handbook is your guidebook. His handbook is your guidebook. He supernaturally takes scripture words and make them life action deeds in you. But it doesn't just happen poof. You have to spend time in it. And when you're spending time in it, the Godhead goes to work. The Holy Spirit begins to tenderize your heart to His things. The Lord Jesus Christ begins to shine out of you when you put into action the things, the deeds that are there. Now let's ask further, how does He show you? How does He show you? Well, God confirms through His Word. Not only does He speak to you through His Word, but He confirms through His Word. Because there are things that happen in our life, in our everyday life. He, he uses circumstances, some of life's circumstances. I, I want you to know sometimes when there are some bad, hard circumstances that come, that is God adding a little pressure into your life possibly, to get you to come to Him and say, Lord God, what do you want me to do? What do you have for me? And our tendency is, a lot of times, to figure it out ourselves. Get a pen and paper out, start writing down. Okay, that one. When all the time, our life circumstances can be checked out against the Word of God and we begin to see what God is doing in us. God is speaking to us. He's telling us. Not only does He use circumstances to confirm His Word, He uses confirmation by others. Sometimes someone comes and says, you know, I'm sensing God is doing this. You're like, or just, we'll just make a, a general statement. You know, God has blessed me through you. I saw you over there praying the other day with a group of ladies. We had two groups, folks, last week in the living room during fellowship time praying with one another. Wow. And isn't it amazing the pastor didn't initiate it? The Holy Spirit did. There were people there confirming. So there's confirmation by others. And then he uses life corrections, you know. Like you're driving down the road. And all of a sudden you see a blue light behind you. And he makes you aware that you haven't registered your vehicle. Or that you're driving with your door wide. Oh no, we're not. <laughs> or that you're speeding or something like that, right? And there's some life corrections. And God tells you that there's that there's a, a higher level of that we, have God that we as God's people are to follow after. We keep the speed limit. We, we register our vehicles. We pay our taxes. We do what we're supposed to do. But I want you to know, when he confirms these things, whether circumstances or confirmation by others or life corrections, he always does it in the light of Scripture. The light of Scripture. Why? Because this is the guidebook. This is the guidebook. It can never be what we think. It is always what does God think. Again, the contemporary English version, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Mark this down on your little sheets of paper. Look these verses up. They are dynamic. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So you see, God tells us. God shows us what we need to know through life by that handbook, His Word. So what do we know about God that He has told mankind, and we're looking back now at Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, number one, what is good? What is good? The things that are good from God's viewpoint. There are a lot of things out there that are good to us, but they may not be good for us. Right? You ever think of that? I mean, 1 Corinthians says that. I think it's chapter 8. You know, that all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. What's that saying? Those things may seem good, but they may not be good for us. So let's talk about what is good. What is good? Good is the opposite of evil. The opposite of evil. And the Hebrew word is just a very basic term. It, it, it's the word, trans, it's translated, I'll try to pronounce what the word is, tob, T-O-B-E, in a sense, to be, <laughs> to be a goodie. But it's tob, I believe, is the way it's pronounced. Which means good in the greatest and the widest sense. But it also means to be better, to be best. The things that are best are good in God's sight. The word good describes just in the very basic dictionary things that are upright, virtuous, noble, wholesome. In God's eyes, good is everything that embraces who God is as compared to the evil one to Satan who is evil. And so it's the opposite of evil. That's a separation. A separation. You came into this world tainted, folks. The Bible says that your parents sin, their parents sin, all the way back to Adam was imputed on your account. What does that mean? Well, that's a, that's a monetary term. You get a lot of imputations on your bank statements when you get that every month. Whether it's a deposit that you made or a withdrawal that got taken out of that account. It was placed on the account. The sin of Adam and all those before you were placed on your account when you came into this world. So, if you look back in your little baby picture book and I've seen mine and I choose to close it up what's that? what's that? thank you baby girl she says I was cute what's that? you were cute I were cute, yes there it is I were cute <laughs> But you know, one thing I noticed in that book is, is that there were imprints in ink of my footprints, right? And I don't see it when I open it up, but I'll tell you, when God looks at that, he sees Mike Tremblay's footprints, and I was just moments old when they took that. And you know what he sees? Sinner, sinner. One for each foot. Because I walk in the way of sin. Because that's been placed on my account by my dad. I love him. But his dad placed it on my dad all the way back from Adam. So the key descriptive word is separation. When we do good, we need to be separated from that which is evil or not good and sinful. The next um, thing that we want to look at that is good is righteousness. Righteousness. 
And we read about that quite a bit in Scripture. In fact, you go into the, the Proverbs and you read some of those words. The word righteous, uh, building a righteous root. Do you ever read that? That's God talking to us. Telling us what, what He desires, folks, from His perspective, remember? His ways, His thoughts for us. To build a righteous root. Which is this whole idea of being good, decent, upright, honest, even blameless are words that connect with righteousness. Almighty God wants you and I to know and to be shown what is right. And as you know, rightness is the opposite of wrongness. And so we've given you a key descriptive word, justification, which you have heard too. Giving you big words, right? Righteousness, justification. But literally, justification is what someone has said once was well, just as if I had never sinned. Well, it's even bigger than that, folks. It's even bigger than that. The, the real meaning of justification is that God has declared you righteous. You are right. Just like He declared you in those little baby footprints, sinner, when you come to the cross, when you come to Jesus Christ who died for you, and you cry out to Him and say, Lord, save me. I receive your Son, Jesus, as my Savior. He then declares you righteous. You should be jumping up and down in your seats even more than you would. And we're going to say if the Patriots are playing in the Super Bowl today and they just got a touchdown. Right? It's, it's greater than that, folks. Being declared righteous. Because whatever happens in the Super Bowl today is just a historical event. And, and it'll go down in history, but you know those history books will burn at the end. And nobody will know. But for you to be declared righteous by Almighty God takes you into eternity with Him. That's how vital it is. And so God has told you what is good. The opposite of evil. Righteousness, and then, then we have a third term here, and that's holiness. Holiness. Which means purified, devout, consecrated, saintly. Wow. In and through Christ, you have been made whole. And you've been made holy. You say, me? Holy? Yeah, you. Because it's God's plan of salvation. In that plan, for you, is the act of declaring you positionally perfect. That's what holiness is. Perfection. All have sinned, all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? What's the thing that makes God, God, and man, man? Right? He's holy. He's perfect. And He's able to make you positionally perfect in Christ by receiving Him as your Savior. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that exciting? Some call it the wow factor, I guess. Wow. <laughs> wow. There's that big word now. Sanctification, a descriptive word. In the, in the flesh is desecration. In Christ is sanctification. You're made holy. Made holy. God is good, holy, righteous. And He's shown you what is good. God spoke good things. The Holy Spirit is good, holy, righteous. And the Holy Spirit leads to good things. And Jesus Christ is good, holy, 
righteous. And Jesus did good things. And Jesus, folks, is with you. <coughs> when you receive him as Savior and Lord, he is with you. John 10 calls Jesus Christ the good shepherd. In fact, Jesus called himself that. I am the good shepherd, right? And, and, and the good shepherd of John 10 is also the almighty shepherd of Psalm 23, which I will read for you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you see that? He, he leads you there in the righteousness because it, it's his name that's on the line here. For his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Is that separation? You anoint my head with oil, setting me apart, making me holy. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. Forever. Your good shepherd makes good sheep when they follow after him. He leads to good pastures, causing you to do good works. He is your awesome teacher of good and your amazing leader to do good. So, knowing God, He's told you what is good. What is good. He's shown you what is good. The good shepherd makes good sheep. Okay, not only does he do that, the verse goes on to say, he shows what God requires. Not only what is good, but what God requires. And look closely, if you would, with, with me, at some of the big requirements of God. If you were to go into Exodus chapter 20, and 21, you would read of the Ten Commandments. And that's his, now listen, perfect directives. Oh, how you know it. Because if you've broken one of the ten, no matter how slow your sonometer is going up in heaven. Right? We talked about that last week. Remember? One of you guys is in the records room being used as a fan. All those sins. No matter, no matter if you just broke one commandment in God's sight, you've broken them all. Who here hasn't lied? Who here hasn't, you know, even thought about stealing or cheating? Who here hasn't made something above God in their life. You follow what I'm saying? That's his perfect directives. That's what God requires. You know, unless the Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 10, is it? Or 11? It says, holiness, that standard of perfection is required for you to go to heaven. Follow after holiness, which no man will ever see God without, is what it says in Hebrews. But you know what that means? That means your position, folks, which you have nothing to do with. It's Jesus who comes into your life and cleanses you, makes you holy. But this is, the per this is God's perfect directive. Jesus, when he walked on this earth, gave perfect words of justice. Right? An eye for an eye. And a tooth for a tooth. He didn't say perfect justice is what we see in our 
judicial system today, right? You know, let's plea bargain. <laughs> let's plead it out. Or um, this young gal that, that just got reconvicted. We call that double jeopardy here in America, but over in Italy, I guess it wasn't. So she got reconvicted of something that she was unconvicted of. Once again, we're talking about God's perfect justice, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. See, God requires perfection. He requires perfection. Mark this verse down in your Bibles. 1 John 2, 2, a very, very good verse. But it has a word in it, and you know, I looked in some of the newer translations, and it really doesn't speak as well as the word propitiation does. You know, to say atonement, or a covering, or a um, cleansing, or something like that, is, is just surface stuff. You know, because because atonement, the word means covering. You know, the the thing that happened in the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament is an atonement. You know, the blood, and it just cut, it was just good for a year. That's not what Jesus did. It says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And, and essentially what that means, what the word propitiation means, is that it is the satisfaction of the justice God requires. Right? God requires the payment of sin. Dearly beloved, that's why Jesus hung on the cross. That's why Jesus went to the grave. He took your sins. And He paid the payment. Only Jesus could take the payment of sin of man because he was sinless to become that blameless, that unblemished sacrifice for you and me. But he didn't stay in the grave, he rose again. It, it's, it's the appeasement of what God requires. And what that mean, means is, is that it's only, what God requires is perfection. It's only available through Christ. So, there we go. Perfection. Only available through Christ. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy God's requirement for sin's payment. The cross became your appeasement, if I can put it that way. Jesus took your place. For your payment of sin. And you know if you have never come to him. And say Lord Jesus be my savior. Today's the day folks. Can I tell you this. God brought you here. God designed for you to be here. Because this wonderful message of the gospel. Of Jesus dying for you. Raising for you. Offering for you life eternal. Just by simple faith believing. I believe I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. And Lord, I take Jesus Christ to be my Savior, to be my Lord. And that's an invitation. Don't leave here today without coming to talk to me or Wayne, Steve or Roy. Ask Jesus to be your Savior. Because God requires perfection. And the best thing you've ever done won't cut it with the Holy One. But Jesus does. He does. God requires not only perfection, but obedience. Obedience. Really interesting story in, uh, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15. The, um, the children of Israel went out to uh, fight off King Agag and, and, to, uh, and, and with God's power and might they, they went there and did a complete wipeout, just about, just about. 
Because that was God's command. Remember now, God demands things. God requires things. And the thing that he told the people to do is to go and to kill this whole nation. And was it the Amalekites? I forget for a moment who, who it was. But King Agag was brought back. And when he comes back, you know, here they're dragging him along, and Samuel says, what's this? You know, do I hear some of the bleeding of sheep? You know, do I, am I looking at the king? Did God not tell you to utterly wipe out King Agag and all of his nation? And you're coming back with this? Oh, well, we did this to sacrifice to the Lord. And this is what Samuel says. First Samuel 15.22, Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. Obedience, dearly beloved, is essential. It's essential. It's not optional. What does God require? That we obey. He required that this nation obey. And although he came in and gave them a great victory, there's a great payment that had to be made because of disobedience. And disobedience, by the way, it goes on to say, because, it, because disobedience usually happens because of rebellion, doesn't it? And what does it say about rebellion? Rebellion is as... Listen to this. Where's Franz now? Rebellion, this is, goes right on in this verse as you read it. Write it down, look it up later. Rebellion is as witchcraft. Isn't that amazing? In other words, it comes from the depths of hell. It's satanic. Obedience is essential. Because that's what God requires. What God requires. And He's shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires. But don't see it in a negative sense. This is God embracing you. Because the third thing God requires is relationship. You know, you look at these perfection obedience, you say, Oh, I'm doomed. You know, I'm not perfect. I don't obey well. But you know what he wants to do? He wants to come to you and he wants to, boom, meet you, embrace you, love you, place deep within you the wonders of who he is. So Galatians 5, 22 to 26. Watch, this is so good. You know the fruit of the Spirit. You've heard that. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's also keep in step with the Spirit. That's a relationship, folks. Amen. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Relationship with God affects our relationship with others. He requires that you walk in His Spirit. And you know what that is? That's growth pattern. You walk closer by His Spirit this year than you did a year ago. If you're growing. If you're growing. So, the, the, the realm of holiness is so good <laughs> that God wants to take holiness and humanity and bring them together. God requires you get on board with Him for this great reward, this eternal salvation when you follow Him. So, so what do I do? What is required? What do I do? What is required? Well, I I think he's told you 
what is good and what is required. I, I have a, a little step I want to show you. And I don't know if it's coming first or the closing. Yeah, here it is. Watch this. Because God is calling you back to Him. Here in 2014 to shine. Through. Very painful watching the willful wanderer pull out the suitcase, pack up the things. Are you really going to do this? Yes, I am. And off they go. They don't know what's up. They don't know what's down. They don't know where to go. They don't know how to get out. People who have wandered from the truth, they're not in the light. They're in darkness. This is one of the messages that the wanderer desperately needs to know. The past can be forgiven. The hurts can be healed. What did the, what did the father do? He, he waited, waited, waited for that son who was living like a pig. But when he came home, he ran to him and he fell upon him and he threw his arms around him and he threw a party for him and, and he celebrated my son. He was lost, but now he's found. All of the hopes, all of the dreams, all of the plans, all of the prayers, it was all for this day. Don't ever wonder how God the Father feels when a wanderer comes home. You can bless the heart of God. You can kick off a true party in your honor, willful wanderer. Come home. Come home. say, well, I'm, I'm not like the, the wayward wolf or wanderer. Well, if we're not growing spiritually, because when I'll show you again what spiritual growth means, then you've wandered. You've wandered. Because spiritual growth means, as we've seen already in the first part of Micah 6 8, is daily. You hear what I said? Daily. Doing what is good. Doing what is good. And you're coming home when you determine in your heart I'm going to do what is good. And, and daily doing what God requires. And that's why we said we need to be in this book. The man that led me to Christ, John DeBryan, some of you know him. When I was 14 years old, I'm in the, I'm in the um, Tremont Temple in Boston. And I went with a friend just because I'm so excited to go to the city. You know? And here I sat in this big Tremont Temple. I'm in the higher balcony. And uh, John O'Brien, who has a, even to today, has his radio broadcast called Song Time. He's 80 some odd years old and he's even slurring in some of his speech I heard him the other day. But he invited me to come, to follow. I became a Christ follower that day. That was when I was 14. I just turned 16 hours. We are at a place that every year God gives us another year to breathe. Am I more for Him at 60 than I was at 14? I better be. I better be. And that means to daily do what is good. Daily. Do what God requires.